All right, welcome back everybody. And today what we're gonna be going over in lecture is going to be that of English colonization. Now the past couple of lectures, what we've talked about is the Spanish when they've arrived over in the New World and what their colonies would look like. Then we moved on to the French. And today we're going to talk about the third power that's going to emerge on the North American continent to heavily colonize the region, that of the English. And we'll be diving into their motivations and we'll see that the society that the English construct is going to look different, as well as the motivations to what will fuel these colonists to come to the New World will also look drastically different. Now, with the beginning of exploration, beginning around that year 1492, when we see the arrival of Christopher Columbus, we see that the English were also somewhat interested in exploration. Actually, the first English uh, explorer will arrive in the New World by, the, uh, by 1497. And the English themselves will even establish a present within the, or just off of the North a Atlantic coast as a result of fishing lanes that we see there, especially in regards to fishing for cod, as well as other fish off of the main as well as North Atlantic waters. And we also saw, or we'll also see that the English, they get involved off the Atlantic coast through piracy as they were looking to uh, conduct raids against Spanish ships that were sailing out of the Caribbean that were filled with either Aztec or Inca gold. And with these two industries, that's when the English first start to navigate and document the uh, Atlantic coastline. However, it won't be until we get to the 1600s that the English will actually begin to arrive in large numbers. But anyways, before we talk about that first English colony that emerges at Jamestown in 1607, let's first talk about why are the English beginning to explore? What were their motives? What were they after when they were coming over to the New World? Now, what's going to fuel the English and their expansion out into the uh, North American continent is going to be very similar to what we had seen with both the Spanish as well as the French. When they arrive on the American continent by the late 1500s, the major resource that they are looking for is going to be that of gold. They are wanting to bring gold into their own vaults, and I'll add up here on the board, resources as well, valuable commodities that would be worth their weight to come back over to England. Now, with the early colonies, they will quickly realize that there's not a whole lot of gold, especially in places like Virginia as well as New England, and they will quickly turn their motives to other reasons. Now, other reasons to why the English are eventually going to colonize the uh, Atlantic coastline would also include uh, the cause for pursuing religious freedom. Now, religious freedom was a major notion by this point, or by the early 1600s in England. Just to understand a little bit of background on what was occurring over in England at this time, we'll see that there are different uh, groups, or I should say different Christian groups, different Christian denominations that had emerged as a result of the Reformation. Just in short, the Reformation was an event that began in the early 1500s in Europe to where we see the Catholic Church splits, to where we see, obviously, the uh, uh, modern-day Catholic Church, but we also see the formation of Protestant groups who will follow the teachings of either Martin Luther or of that of, um, or of, that of, uh, of John Calvin. Now, with that said, England is going to be gripped by this Reformation movement, and they will actually form the Church of England. However, many of their practices within the Church of England are going to look strikingly similar to what the Catholic Church was also doing. And there will be several groups that will challenge the Church of England, saying that they did not complete the Reformation, that they did not go far enough in trying to expel uh, popery, as they called it, from their realms. We'll see this with groups like the Puritans as well as the Quakers a little bit later on. But because of the fact that they were challenging the Church of England, which at its head was the uh, King of England, this is where we'll start to see anti-Puritan, anti-Catholic, and other anti-non-Church uh, uh, of uh, England uh, groups would have laws passed against them. And we'll talk more about that, especially once we get to the Puritans here in a little bit. And so some of these individuals will look to escape this religious persecution that we see back over in England. And there will be several other motives, but the last motive that I wanted to discuss that will be prevalent over in, um, over in England to what will fuel colonization in the New World will be that of poverty. Now, poverty itself was a major issue with England at this time. One thing we need to understand about England, it's an island nation. 
It had roughly about five million people living in there uh, or on those islands during the uh, early 1600s. Now, why does that prove problematic? Well, it's because with an island nation, you are very limited on the amount of land that you can hand out to not just nobles and the aristocracy, but also to common people. And at this point, there was a major issue because there was a lack of land, and this generated widespread poverty. There was actively beggars within the streets of um, uh, London at this time, and the king, as well as many within Parliament, were trying to resolve how can they solve this issue. And so many of these individuals who were in a poverty-stricken state will actually see that the American colonies would present their opportunity for a second chance to where they could potentially get their own land to where they could eventually flourish in the long run. And we'll see that will be a major motivation for several individuals to go to the Americas uh, from England so that way they could escape that poverty stricken state. Now there are several other reasons, but these are just the three major ones that I wanted to highlight for this lecture. But anyways, let's start talking about English colonization and when it begins to take place. Now, English or the first attempts at making a colony within North America will begin in the 1580s by England. We'll see there will be a colonization effort in Nova Scotia in 1582, and also the most infamous uh, colonization effort uh, of Roanoke Island in 15, um, circa 1585 to 1587. Both of those are going to end in spectacular failures. And it won't be until we see the establishment of Jamestown in 1607 before we see the English establish a permanent colony in the New World. Now, Jamestown will be established in 1607 in a region that will become known as Virginia. Where Virginia gets its name is from the recently deceased, at this time, the recently deceased Queen Elizabeth I, who is known as the Virgin Queen. And so they wanted to honor her by naming Virginia in her honor as a result of her supposed celibacy. But nonetheless, they would come over to the New World, and in 1607, Virginia would finally be populated with the settlement of Jamestown in 1607. Really quick, Jamestown will also be named after the current English monarch at the time, that of King James, as well as the James River to where it is based off of. However, when Jamestown was first settled in 1607, the mostly male colonists, or I shouldn't say the mostly male, the all male colonists who arrive in Jamestown in that year are going to find the climate very difficult to live in. One, most of those who arrive in Jamestown were actually looking for gold. They were trying to find those uh, or that resource that could help bring them riches. And many of those who arrive in Jamestown in 1607 are not going to be farmers. And that will prove problematic in the long run because they won't be able to produce their own crops and they will begin to starve over time. Not to mention when they arrive in Jamestown in 1607, that region of the Chesapeake Bay in modern day Virginia, it is extremely swampy. Disease will run rampant, and we'll see that the mortality rate for the first couple of decades of the existence of this colony will be over 50%. And that will also contribute to why not a lot of people are going to want to go to Jamestown, not just during the, uh, in 1607, but a little bit afterwards as well. But anyways, they will nonetheless establish their um, colony within the Chesapeake Bay region. Now, what's going to continue to fuel the uh, colony at Jamestown is going to be the fact that the colony itself was backed by a joint stock company. Now, what a joint stock company is, is it's basically a company where there's a bunch of investors who put money into it to hopefully establish a colony. And if that colony was profitable, if they were to find gold or another crash crop, those investments would go up, just like what we see with stocks today. However, with this joint stock company, in order to make sure that Jamestown would ultimately be profitable and successful, it had to continuously send supplies. And slowly over the course of the next couple of years, we'll see that the Jamestown colony will begin to expand. However, the mortality rate is going to continue to be a major issue for Jamestown. It will continue to remain over 50%, and even 80% of the uh, uh, initial uh, Jamestown colonists who arrived in 1607 were dead by the time we get to um, to the year 1610. And as we get into the 1610s, as it becomes clear that there was no gold in Virginia, and as it becomes clear that there was an ongoing war between the local inhabitants in Jamestown as well as the Powhatan Confederation, we'll see that the Virginia Company is going to have to develop a different method to ensure that these colonists would ultimately survive and that the colony would survive. Now, by the late 1610s, we're going to see that the Jamestown colony, mainly led by an individual by the name of John Rolfe, who ironically is the guy who would marry the historical Pocahontas from the Disney film, he will uh, begin to dabble into a local cash crop that will prove to be extremely addictive, but more importantly, extremely popular and lucrative back over in Europe. And it will be that of tobacco. 
Now tobacco will really be the first cash crop that we see arrive, arise within the, in, within the English colonies and eventually within the United States. As mentioned before, it's extremely addictive and it will be extremely um, an extremely lucrative cash crop when it arrives back over in England. And in Virginia, it has the perfect farmland to produce large amounts of tobacco. And we'll start to see that based off of tobacco, the Jamestown colony will slowly begin to succeed and expand out into the wider region of Virginia itself. However, even as we start to see John Rolfe uh, dabble into introducing tobacco into the local economy within Virginia, there is still a major issue because even with this lucrative commodity, by the late 1610s, that Virginia company, it was having major issues trying to get people to actually come to Jamestown, mainly because of that high mortality rate. And so they will have to establish a policy by the late 1610s to counter this to ensure that this tobacco industry would emerge uh, on a large scale and ultimately the colony would be successful. Now what they're going to introduce is known as the Headright Program. Now the Headright Program itself is very simple to understand. In order to influence colonists to go over to the New World to actually risk their lives since there was a one in two chance of you dying in the first year, what this head rate program promoted is that if you were able to pay for your passage over to Virginia, the Virginia company would give you 50 acres of land for free. All you had to do is purchase your ticket over to the New World. However, they will make the deal even sweeter. For each additional person that you bring to the New World, for each person you would get an additional 50 acres. So let's say if you bring over a family of five, Time, or take 50 acres times five, you would have over 250 acres that would be yours for free. All you would have to do is um, pay for their passage. And on top of that, if you bring over servants, you will also be able to include them in this deal to where you can get an additional 50 acres of land per servant. Now, what this is also going to introduce is what's known as the indentured servant system. Now, the indentured servant system or I should say these indentured servants that will arrive over in the New World, most of them are going to be these relatively poor Englishmen that we see back over in Europe. Now, with the Hedrick program in place, there will be advertisements that will be put out by many of these wealthier individuals to try to get individuals to travel to the New World as their servants so they can get those uh, additional acres of land. Now, many uh, uh, of these individuals back over in England who were in a poverty-stricken state are going to take advantage of this. They would have their ticket paid to the New World, to where they would have a new opportunity at life, to where in the future, if they served out these contracts, and I'll talk about them here in a second, they might even have the prospect of gaining their own land, something they had no prospect back over in England. And all they had to do in order to get over to the New World, to have their ticket paid for, is they had to agree to a contract. They would sign with the local gentry or the local aristocracy, whoever was paying for their ticket, they would sign a contract to where for the course of the next seven to 10 years, they would agree to serve on that individual's plantation or within their household uh, for that um, duration of time. And if they were to live out that time, so if they were to uh, fill, fulfill that contract to seven and 10 years, they would then be free and perhaps have an incentive to where they can get their own land, something once again they could not get back over in England. And this is going to be widely popular and this is going to promote or push tens of thousands of individuals from England to take advantage of the system, whether they were rich or poor, to come over to Virginia. And by the 1620s, we will start to see that the Virginia colony, centered around this headright program, as well as the introduction of tobacco to their colony, will begin to expand. Now in regards to Virginia, and we'll see this with much of the South, with this headright program in place, it's going to establish large plantations. What does that mean? While the, especially in the case of Virginia, while it will be densely populated, it will not have large cities like we see here in the United States today, but rather people will be scattered all throughout the countryside. And that will look drastically different from the colony we're about to talk about here in just a moment that will begin to form up in the north in the New England region. We'll talk about them here in a second. But anyways, with the introduction of this indentured servant system that we see, we will see it'll sow kind of the seeds for discontent amongst the local population, especially amongst those poor whites who are going to realize after serving their contract, they're not necessarily getting the land that they were promised. And eventually this is going to lead us down the road to an all out revolt. Now, the revolt that will occur, which will occur later on in the century in 1676 between these indentured servants and that ruling upper class, is going to be known as Bacon's Rebellion. 
Now, Bacon's Rebellion itself, it will begin mainly centered around these indentured servants who are going to have a lot of problems with the local ruling class, most notably with the current governor of Virginia at the time, that of William Berkeley. He had recently passed a series of policies during the 1670s to where he basically bans land speculation to where individuals, whether they were indentured servants or members of the upper class, to where it was illegal for them to go out to the West and take native lands. The reason for this is Berkeley wanted to avoid hostilities with those local tribes, something that we see commonplace during this period. However, this is going to frustrate many of these indentured servants because the only way they could get land over in the New World is if they went out West and they took it from these Native Americans, especially after they were seeing their contracts expire. And so they're going to be very discontent with this. Not to mention there's also going to be taxes that are going to be leveled against this class and several other issues that they're going to raise a little bit later on. And then by 1676, they will find a common ally within the ruling class, within the elite class, that of Nathaniel Bacon, who will take up their cause with them. Nathaniel Bacon, with about a thousand of these indentured servants, as well as a few uh, African slaves, is going to march on the capital at Jamestown. He will burn it to the ground, and with it, force William Berkeley out of the capital into what would eventually become the new colonial capital, Williamsburg, Virginia. Now, in the midst of all this, word will arrive back across the Atlantic over into uh, Britain. And we'll see that the British will dispatch troops to come over to Virginia to uh, squash this rebellion. However, by the arrival of these British troops in the uh, New World, we'll see that Bacon's rebellion had ended in a complete failure after Nathaniel Bacon had um, died of uh, dysentery, if I remember correctly. And we'll see that the rebellion would slowly unravel. Now, Bacon's rebellion is going to have major implications moving forward mainly in regards to this indentured servant system. Now, the indentured servant system itself, and I'll talk more about it when we get to slavery in the colonies a little bit later on, it will be a, not a permanent form of bondage, but a temporary form of bondage. Now, also around the same time that we see this indentured servant system introduced in the Americas, we see African slavery, which will be race-based, which will be a permanent condition, and it will be hereditary. What I mean by that is African slaves who are thrown into bondage after they were captured in Africa, for the rest of their lives they would live in the state of slavery, and if they were to have children in bondage, unlike the indentured servant system, those individuals would also be considered slaves, would be considered property. And we'll see that with Bacon's rebellion, the royal officials, not wanting to have this large discontent poor white class, will start to transition from this indentured servant system over to African slavery to where it will be monitored by slave codes, which are restrictions against these uh, individuals in bondage, stating that they are property, beast of burden, rather than human beings. Now, I do have a couple of examples on the lecture slides and read through the Virginia um, Slave Code of 1669 on the lecture slides that are po posted online. Uh, but anyways, these laws were meant to prevent revolts and to ensure that these individuals would know nothing other than bondage. It will become widely popular after Bacon's Rebellion. All right, moving on from Virginia, now we're going to turn our attention a little bit further north and talk about other colonization efforts that were beginning to take place in the English colonies around the same time. Now, Jamestown will be the first official colony established within the Atlantic seaboard. The second colony that will be established by the English will be that of Plymouth in 1620. And this is where we're going to see that group known as the Pilgrims, who are famed for the first Thanksgiving. This is where they're going to come to populate the region that we better know today as New England or Massachusetts. Now, why are these individuals coming over to this region of the uh, Atlantic seaboard? Why at this moment in time, and do they have similar motivations to those individuals we just talked about in Virginia? Well, these Puritan groups, including the Pilgrims, who were arriving in Massachusetts during the 1620s and 1630s, are going to come for very different reasons. Now, we talked about some of the motivations for English colonists, and the reason that the Puritans are going to arrive over in Massachusetts was to escape religious persecution, to achieve greater religious freedom um, in a colony within the New World from what we see over in England. Now, the Puritans themselves, who were they? What was this religious group back over in England? Now, the Puritans were this more radical uh, Protestant group that emerges after the English Reformation. And they're basically making a couple of arguments. The first and probably the most important argument that they are making and that's going to lead to their persecution is they are stating that the uh, English church, the Church of England that was uh, headed by the King of England, was still too Catholic. 
that the Reformation wasn't complete and that uh, new reforms were needed in order to purify it, to eliminate this church hierarchy system, to eliminate bishops and archbishops and the head of the church itself, to ensure that only ministers and congregations were the center, if you will, of their communities that would administer their religious life. Well, this became wildly unpopular because by challenging the authority of the king and the Church of England, some of these groups are going to be viewed as almost traitors and uh, be charged in some cases with treason. And it's a no surprise that we start to see anti-Puritan laws would be established by the late 1500s and into the beginning of the 1600s. And some of the more radical groups of Puritans, most notably the Pilgrims, who are known as the Separatists, are going to look for an opportunity to escape this religious persecution. Now, in regards to the Pilgrims, first they're going to try to go over to the Dutch and Holland, who are a very religiously tolerant community, or I should say nation. However, even though they were religiously tolerant, the Pilgrims would see them as too corrupt, as they are focused on trade and um, profits as opposed to religion. They will then turn back to England and then go over to the Atlantic seaboard to where they would establish a colony at Plymouth in 1620 off the New Eng or in, Cape Co in Cape Cod in New England. Now from here, I'm not going to talk about the entire story of the uh, Pilgrims. You can be more than willing to look it up online. But essentially, they will establish the first colony that would serve as kind of a launching point for other colonies. Words of the success of those uh, initial Puritans who arrive over in the New World will arrive back over in England, and by the 1630s, in what was known at the time as the Great Migration, we'll see over 12,000 individuals from the Puritan community in England are going to leave and go to Massachusetts. And they will begin to settle towns like Boston, Salem, and several others throughout the region. Now, when they go over to Massachusetts, we'll see that the Puritans, mainly led by an individual by the name of John Winthrop, they were trying to establish a strictly Puritan society that will be very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That will be very, uh, not rigorous, but it would be very rigid, there we go, to where Basically, you had to be a member of the church to participate in politics, to hold public office, and to have any sort of say in the community. And while they were fleeing religious persecution back over in England, they didn't necessarily practice it within their own realms. They would condemn other groups of uh, Protestant denominations if they did not have similar beliefs. And we'll see that there's kind of a, a um, hypocrisy almost developing in this. And it's no surprise that many individuals in the Puritan community upon their arrival will be very discontent with this. And this is where individuals like Roger Williams and several other ministers are going to leave the uh, main colony in Massachusetts and begin to uh, create colonies in Rhode Island and May, uh, Maine, as well as several other areas. And sorry about that, my lights keep going out. But anyways, this is where they will create some of those other colonies that will make those states up in the New England. But anyways, the Puritans will come to dominate the region, and we'll see, though, that with their very strict religious code, it's a no surprise that they will eventually come into conflict with the natives, who do not practice Christianity, and who they believed were pagans, and essentially individuals who would corrupt any one of these uh, Puritans who came into contact with them. Now, the Puritans themselves, they wanted their communities to be in uh, close-knit communities. And they viewed that going out on the frontier, living amongst the Indians, was one of the worst things that you could do. While you were naturally, uh, uh, while you had natural liberty out on the frontier, you didn't have moral liberty. And they believed they were becoming morally corrupt by living amongst the natives. And by the 1640s, we'll see that the Puritans, they will begin efforts to try to convert the native population to their ways of life. Now, there will be some natives who will openly accept this. However, for the most part, Native Americans are going to be very resistant to this. And ultimately, we'll see one individual by the name of Medicom, who was the uh, head of the Wampaponag tribe, who was the main tribe that the Puritans first encounter, including the Pilgrims when they arrived in Massachusetts, is going to have enough around that uh, same time that we see Bacon's Rebellion in 1675 and 1676. And he's going to wage a war against the colonists that will threaten to completely destroy the Massachusetts colony, that of King Philip's War. Now, King Philip's War, it will rage over the course of the better uh, months of a year, from 1675 to 1676. And it will prove to be one of the costliest conflicts, not just in colonial history, but in American history. By the end of the war, we'll see that uh, almost three quarters of the native population had been virtually wiped out, whether they were enslaved or, uh, which one I mean by enslaved, they were sold into slavery in the uh, Caribbean, or they were just completely pushed out of Massachusetts. Not to mention, we'll also see that 5%, and even as high as 10% of the colonial population perhaps died with 
within King Philip's war. And the war itself became so, um, so, uh, uh, the war itself became so contested that ultimately we start to see the colonists would enact the first conscription acts in American history, or the first uh, draft laws, if you will, to take individuals from the ages of 16 to 60 into the armed forces to fight against uh, King Philip, or Medicum. But anyways, King Philip's war will ultimately end in a victory for the colonists and solidify that their colony, even though it may have been on the verge of being wiped out by a King Philip's horses, that it would maintain itself within the region. And moving forward, there would be no natives who would challenge their authority uh, within that region. Now, with that said, with the conclusion of King Philip's war, it's going to contribute to a lot of upheaval that we see in the region. That's going to cause a lot of disruption. That will lead us down the road eventually to when we talk about, um, to eventually when we start seeing the Salem Witch Trials. Now, shortly after King Philip's War, we'll see that Massachusetts itself by the 1680s is going to be rocked by events that were occurring back over in England. Now, by the 1680s, and we'll talk more about this in class next time, or uh, in lecture next time, but we're going to see that there's a new king in England, a Catholic king, who's going to try to promote some policies that were more religiously tolerant, especially for Catholics back over in England. And he will form the New England colonies into one super colony, into what he would call the Dominion. And he would appoint a man by the name of Edmund Andros, who will be the governor of the Dominion, who would look to ensure that these Puritans would not be able to self-govern, that they would not have a strict society to where there was no separation of church and state, and that they had to accept other Protestant denominations, especially the, those members of the Church of England. Now, by doing so, this is going to upset many Puritans, and eventually they're going to rise up, and we'll talk about that when we get to the Glorious Revolution a little bit later on. But also around that same time, as we start to see that there are colonial, or I should say royal governors trying to promote this idea of Massachusetts to bring about this change, there's also going to be a massive conflict. In 1689, we're going to see the beginning of what's known as King William's War, which will be waged in the colonies between the French as well as the English to the south. And there will be a great amount of refugees who are going to flock into Massachusetts itself. And with these new arrivals into uh, communities like Salem, as well as Boston, and with the recent laws that had promoted religious uh, toleration, there was a lot of suspicion within the Puritan community. And this uh, is going to lead us down the road to the Salem Witch Trials. With the Salem Witch Trials, what we'll see is everything that's occurred, it's going to create a great amount of religious hysteria. And we'll start to see that they're going to begin to target many individuals that they deemed as outsiders and convict them as witches. Now, with the Salem Witch Trials, nobody's going to be burned at the stake, but there will be uh, a or about um, a couple dozen individuals who will be executed as a, res as a result of the Salem Witch Trials. However, by 1693, we'll see that the Salem Witch Trials would slowly begin to diminish. But because of the fact that we saw the Salem Witch Trials occur, this will undermine basically the religious thought of the Puritans. And we'll start to see that many people aren't going to look at this Puritan community in a very favorable light. And this will only be sort of the beginning of the downfall of Puritanism within Massachusetts. But it will have a tremendous impact for years to come. But we'll talk more about Massachusetts once we get to our next uh, lecture uh, next week. But anyways, we'll talk about that later on. Now moving on from uh, Massachusetts, I wanna talk about a few other colonies that are going to be established in the New World around the same time. And the first of which I wanna point out is going to be that of the Carolinas. Now, after we see the establishment of Plymouth, as well as uh, Virginia, there's really only going to be one colony that will be established between the 1620s and the 1660s, and it'll be that of Maryland. Now, Maryland will be uh, constructed just north of Virginia, and it would be a uh, refuge, if you will, for Catholics coming over from England. However, eventually, its society will look very similar to what we see with Virginia. However, it won't be until the 1660s that we start to see a um, renewed effort by the English crown to try to colonize the Atlantic coastline, this time a little bit further south than Virginia and what is the region known as Carolinas. Now, by the 1660s, we'll see that the new king of England at that time, that of King Charles II, is going to issue out uh, several charters to eight proprietors or to eight individuals, mainly thanking them for restoring him to the crown following the English Civil War. And they will settle in this region that would eventually become known as Carolina, or the land of Charles. And they would also honor him by creating one of their main port cities by naming it after, after him, that of Charlestown. Now, the Carolinas themselves, what we're going to see is they're going to establish basically the model for slavery within the New World. 
Now, before we talk about the model for slavery that will be established in the Carolinas and the plantations that will be established, we need to first understand how the, um, how the English are going to adopt their slavery plantation model. Now, before the establishment of the Carolinas, we'll see that the English were becoming increasingly interested in establishing a colony down in the Caribbean. Now, why were they trying to establish this colony down in the Caribbean? Mainly because the Caribbean islands themselves they had a very lucrative crash crop that could be produced. Not tobacco like in Virginia, but rather sugar. As we all know and love today, sugar is something that we thoroughly enjoy, and Europeans likewise enjoyed sugar at the time. However, in order to produce sugar, it's a very rigorous uh, kind of effort. And it requires a large labor force, and it requires a very warm environment, and that's why they will look to the Caribbean islands to establish these sugar plantations. From here, on the uh, plantations of Barbados or in Jamaica, we'll see that rather than relying on indentured servants, at first they'll rely on them, but rather than relying on them, they would rely on African slaves. Mainly because we'll see that many indentured servants will not want to serve in Barbados or Jamaica because of the harsh working conditions and because the death toll will be relatively high. But anyways, they're going to start to look into African slavery and invest heavily into African slavery. Now, during this period, the majority of the African slaves that were being taken from Africa and brought to the English New World will be brought up to the Caribbean. Most that will come to either Virginia or to the Carolinas and the uh, other colonies within the, um, within the uh, English colonies, they're just going to arrive almost as a side thought. Millions of Africans are going to arrive in the Carolinas and they will have to continuously be replenished because they will die off in large numbers within, or I shouldn't say the Carolinas, within the Caribbean during this period. But anyways, nonetheless, it would establish this plantation model to where there would be this large plantation over, owned by a uh, member of the gentry or a very wealthy individual producing these massive amounts of cash crops. And eventually this model would then be brought to the Carolinas to where they would produce not sugar, but items like rice and indigo. Now these will be lucrative commodities at the time, but over time, once we get to the founding of the American nation, we'll see that Carolina is going to shift from producing uh, those items to producing cotton, as well as the rest of the American South. But we'll talk more about that in the future. But this is where we'll see that slavery is first really going to ingrain itself within the, United, or within the American colonies and then begin to spread northward. Now, while we're on the topic of slavery, I do want to mention that slavery will look different in region to region. Now, in the Carolinas as well as Virginia, you'll see that large plantation model. There will not be a whole lot of towns that will be established here. But rather, you just see plantations dotting all the countryside. Now, with that said, as we see slaves working in these fields, whether in tobacco fields or indigo fields, slavery in New England is going to look drastically different. Slaves will actually arrive in New England a little before we'll see in the Carolinas during the 1630s and they will serve mainly as domestic servants, and it will be in a much smaller scale. You would have individuals not owning tens if not hundreds of slaves, or maybe a couple to help keep up the domestic sphere. And that's going to contribute to why we'll see one society will eventually get rid of slavery while one won't. But anyways, nonetheless, Carolina will basically epitomize the birth of what we recognize as American slavery. Now moving on from the Carolinas just really quick, in 1712 they will split into North and South Carolina because of the fact that they produced two different commodities. But anyways, moving on from the Carolinas, let's now move our attention to the last of the English colonies that will be established by the, um, by the end of uh, the 1600s. That of what's called the Middle Colonies. Now the Middle Colonies are going to include colonies in New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and so on and so forth. And there's only two that I really want to highlight for this video. The first is going to be that of New York. Now, New York itself, it traces its origins back to the early 1600s. And it wasn't initially founded by the English, but rather it was founded by the Dutch. Now, the Dutch Empire, just, or I should say the Dutch nation, just like the English, as well as the French and the Spanish, they were interested in constructing an overseas empire to take resources, whether it was gold or fur or whatever the case may be, and trading it back over to their empire to create a large amount of profits. And they will get invested in colonizing the North American continent first in New York, or at the time of what was known as New Netherlands. They will establish the great uh, city of uh, New Amsterdam, later to become New York City, which was basically the trading post for the region. However, by the 1660s, we'll see that this, well, the uh, well, the Dutch had established New York, it wasn't their most lucrative uh, colony. 
Also by the 1660s, it divided the English colonies. It was a wedge between Virginia and New England. And to try to unify the Atlantic coast under English rule, we'll see in the 1660s the English, mainly led by James Stewart, who would eventually become the King of England, will conquer New Netherlands, as well as the uh, Swedish Empire that was established down in Delaware, and bring them into the English fold. Now, New York itself is going to be a mixture of the economies that develop in Massachusetts as well as the economy that develops down in the South. I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but Massachusetts, it's going to be in a very cold region, a very rocky region too. And their main focus is going to center around trade. Meanwhile, we'll see what we saw in the South, their focus is going to center around producing cash crops, things like tobacco, rice, and indigo. And because of this, Massachusetts will become a very densely populated region in regards to its cities. But turning back to the middle colonies, it will be a mixture of these two societies. You will see these large cities like New York, and you'll also have a large number of individuals who will have their own farms, but they will mainly produce crops like wheat and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, they will have a mixture of both economies, and we'll even see that they would develop a very large slave population because of this. Even New York City's population would consist of 40% of slaves by the time we get to the middle of the 1700s. Now, for the middle colonies, there's one, or there's another um, colony that I wanted to talk about of why it was established, and it will be that of Pennsylvania, which will be established by the 1680s. Now, Pennsylvania itself, it's going to be established by a group known as the Quakers. Now, the Quakers themselves, very similar to what we had seen with the uh, what we had seen with the um, the Puritans. They are going to escape over to the American continent to get some sort of religious freedom, to escape religious persecution back over in the old world. Now, why are the Quakers beginning to arrive over in the Americas in large numbers? Well, it's because of their religious beliefs. They were a pacifist people. They did not believe in paying taxes to the crown and uh, sending off uh, their own peoples to fight in wars. Not to mention, they also challenged, uh, very similar to the Puritans, that there should not be this church hierarchy. And they argued that the congregation itself was the only way that you could produce this individual experience with God. Once again, just like the Puritans, it will make them unpopular. And by the 1680s, we'll see that the king of the England, now King James, uh, who actually was the, or King James II, who was that same James Stuart that we talked about who uh, conquered New York, he's going to appeal to these Quaker groups. He was a Catholic king. And he's trying to get religious minorities like this to be on his side. And to appeal to them, he will appeal to an individual by the name of William Penn, who had recently got a fortune from his late father who had died and left it to him in his will. And he will convince William Penn that a part of that um, will, with the land grant that was present in modern-day Pennsylvania, he should take the Quakers there to seek safe haven. William Penn will listen to him, and he'll eventually go off to establish Pennsylvania, which will be named out in his honor. Now, Pennsylvania itself, it will become the most religiously tolerant community throughout all the American colonies, mainly because of their experience back over in the um, back over in England. Now, for nonetheless, we'll see the uh, Quakers are going to dominate politics within that region, but nonetheless, there were no, unlike the Puritan communities, there were no restrictions to hold office by being solely a member of the Quaker church. All were welcome. Now, for by the time we get to the 1700s, that will change. One, with the death of William Penn, and two, because of the fact that we'll see a large amount of immigrants are going to arrive in Pennsylvania. And because of that arrival, those immigrants will see the emergence of a Navis movement. And we'll talk about that more in the future. But anyways, to wrap up this video really quick, there's one last colony that we have to talk about that will be uh, formed in 1733, and that will be the last of the original 13 colonies, and it will be Georgia. Now, Georgia itself, it will be established south of South Carolina. Now, why is it going to be created? Well, it was meant to be a buffer state between South Carolina and Florida for two reasons. To discourage, um, to discourage Spanish raids into South Carolina and also to stop runaway slaves from South Carolina from getting to Florida, which they saw as a safe haven. And that will be established in 1733 for those purposes. And it was also meant to be a social experiment, to be a sort of utopian um, experiment, if you will, to hopefully have a mixed society that would break down racial barriers. However, that's not going to happen. We'll see that in Georgia, very similarly to South Carolina. They will develop an economy based around slave labor. And by 1750, slavery will be deeply entrenched in Georgia.
But anyways, with that said, that wraps up this discussion and this lecture over the English colonization. I know it was a little bit of a longer video, but we had a lot of material that we had to cover. But anyways, when we uh, meet next time online, we'll be talking about the English colonies and how they're going to continue to mature by the time we get to the 1700s. But anyways, for now, see y'all next time.